while ago, the world watched three gray whales icebound off of Alaska, loaded, battered, bloody, gasping for breath at a hole in the ice. And their only hope somehow was to be transported five miles past the ice pack to the open sea. Rescuers began cutting a string of breathing holes about 20 yards apart in the six inch thick ice. Eight days, they coaxed the whales from one hole to the next mile after mile after mile. And along the way, one of the trio vanished and was presumed dead. But finally, with the help of Russian icebreakers, the whales, their names were Puta and Siku, they swam to freedom. In a way, worship is a string of breathing holes that the Lord provides for his people. Battered and bruised in a world that's frozen over uh, with greed, selfishness, and hatred, we rise for air to worship. We've been isolated for a few weeks now, and that'll probably continue for a while. So we need those little pockets of air. We need those times to come and spend time with God, either in our homes or in our cars, knowing that we're not alone, even if we are isolated. Being in worship gives us a place to breathe again. Being in worship gives us community, as strange as it may seem, online or in separate cars. We're given the privilege to worship to breathe, to be a part of something wonderful. Join me this morning as we open God's word, as we pray, and as we come into the presence of our Lord. But first, let me give you a few announcements. First, I'm glad you're here, wherever here happens to be. Second, each week in our worship folder, uh, I would list what the following Sunday's scripture lesson would be so that you would have an opportunity to read it ahead of time. Let me give that to you now. Next week, Read Matthew chapter 18, verses 21 to 34. Matthew 18, 21 to 34. I'm going to conclude our series called How to Build a House. And the message is entitled Inspection. You may notice if you're online, I'm wearing a headset. That's because we're broadcasting this message to our parking lot through the radio. So welcome, parking lot people. I'll tell you what, honk your horns if you can hear this right now. It's really, really cool to hear that. Also, if you're a child or you consider yourself to be a child, let me share a couple of thoughts with you. First of all, God loves all of us. Some of us are adults who have children. Some of us are teachers who take care of children. Some of us are neighbors who watch over children. I have two pictures with me of, uh, of children. This little girl's name is Anita. And this little boy's name is Edinson. And I have pictures of my kids and grandkids on my walls in my office. These two children that I just mentioned, Edinson and Anita, they look different. They dress differently. They speak differently. They have different routines. What's really neat is that God loves these two children who live far away just as much as he does my children and grandchildren and your children and grandchildren. These two children are our children that we sponsor. And if you're a child, I want you to know that he loves you just as much. He loves you so much that he sent Jesus to show us his great love. And we are to show the love of Jesus to all people, no matter who they are or what they look like. God loves each one of us. So let's pray together and let's get started. Father, thank you for this time that we can be together online, in our cars. We thank you that you are everywhere and that you take care of us everywhere. And we ask that you would keep us safe. We ask that you would help us to be wise in, in the way that we live our lives. Also, that we would be good witnesses. Help us to take care of each other. Help us to call. Help us to, to check on each other in some way. Help us to be Jesus to other people. We ask that you bless our time this morning, that your word would, would go out and it would not come back empty, that we would realize that we have in some way been in your presence as we hear your word. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Over the past few weeks, we've been looking at the parables of Jesus. A parable, if you remember, is a 
an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. And we've been asking, what are we building our lives on? If you have lived a good number of years, you'll discover, if you haven't already, that we are in need of a renovation. A renovation can be painful, it can be difficult. And as I've said previously, demolition precedes renovation. Think about renovating a house. You can come across bad wiring, you can come across bad plumbing, you can come across water damage. Our daughter Carrie and her husband Ben found that they had black mold behind their kitchen cabinets. The previous owners had screwed the cabinets into the drain pipe for the upstairs bathroom. And over a number of years, the screws had become rusted and that eventually leaked. And in order to get rid of the mold that resulted from that, they had to gut the kitchen. They had to remove all of the cabinets, the flooring and the counters. It was very extensive and time consuming, but necessary. The more we examine what's going on in our lives, the more we examine our hearts, that can reveal some pretty profoundly nasty stuff. And that's what this parable will do this morning. Now, for many, this is a very familiar parable, and yet there's some very important lessons that can be learned. So if you have a Bible, turn to Luke chapter 10, and we're going to begin with verse number 25. Let me read you verse 25. <clears throat> On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? First of all, notice this man's motives. He is an expert in the Old Testament law, but his motive is to test Jesus. He's not out to learn something from Jesus. He wants to teach Jesus a lesson. The second thing is that he asks a typical common religious question. What do I do to inherit eternal life? So Jesus plays along with the lawyer, even though he's asking the wrong question. Jesus says, what's written in the law? How do you read it? In other words, you're the expert. What do you think it says? And then imagine a puffed up chest. The lawyer says, well, love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. This is called the Shema, which is a summary of all the laws. And Jesus said, you have answered correctly. Do this and you'll live. Now, what level of arrogance would it take for someone to walk away from that and say, I'm really good? Here's a question. Have you always valued God correctly and demonstrated that perfectly by the way you live? Anybody? We don't value ourselves perfectly or other people perfectly either. And so the lawyer seems to realize, I've backed myself into a corner here. Jesus knows the internal eternal internal eternal life game is to be perfect so the lawyer being a lawyer is about to do some fancy lawyering the bible says he wanted to justify himself and so he asked jesus and who's my neighbor now the word justify means to be declared righteous realize this the lawyer doesn't really zero in on the love god piece of the equation quite possibly because he knows it's difficult to measure. He needs a very narrow definition of the word neighbor to justify the way he treats people and the way he has treated people his entire life. Even at its very basic, neighbor would include your, your friends and, and your family. Think of this, <clears throat> when you get together with your family, is it always perfect? Are, are there some who don't come and you wish they wouldn't? Is it always perfect? This religious view that the lawyer's taking, that he must justify his actions at all times, always leads to the same kind of outcome. You ever notice this? The people who are the most, let's say, religious, have to have a low view of God's law. That leads to a high view of ourselves because we think so highly of ourselves. And when we think so highly of ourselves, that leads to a low view of others. Religious people always end up in a place of profound arrogance 
You know what these three things are? A low view of God's law, a high view of yourself, and a low view of others. In other words, black mold. Jesus begins some demolition so he can have a renovation. Jesus tells a story. As a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers, they stripped him of his clothes, they beat him and went away, leaving him half dead. Now, here's what just happened to everyone listening to Jesus. They would say, yep, that's what happens when you walk down the road by yourself, that particular road. This road was actually called the road of blood. So Jesus goes on. A priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. He'd probably come from the temple, having performed his priestly duties, and notice this. He has made the same bad choice as the guy who ended up in the ditch. He's no different than the man in the ditch. Now, the Greek language indicates that he intentionally walked away from the man to avoid contact. Jesus continues. So to a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. Levites were like the worship leaders in the temple. The folks listening to Jesus would be thinking, this guy will stop for sure. But the same thing happens. And then everything changes on the next few words from Jesus. Jesus says, but a Samaritan. What? See, there was deep, seated hatred between Jews and Samaritan. It would, it would be like a white supremacist in the ditch and a black man walking down the road. What does a Samaritan have to do in the story? Jesus says a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. Now, the word pity does not ad adequately describe what is meant. Compassion is a better word. It's not feeling bad for someone. It's when someone else's pain moves from your head to your heart to your hands. Compassion costs you something. Look at the Samaritan does next. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. And then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said. And when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Now, whose oil was it? Whose wine was it? Whose animal was it? Whose money was it? It was the Samaritans. You see what Jesus has just done in the hearts of everyone listening? He has uncovered black mold. Dark stuff has resided in the hearts of those listening to him and pointing out to us that we most likely would be walking on the other side of the road as well. So Jesus looks at the lawyer and says, which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? Notice this. The lawyer asked the question, <clears throat> who is my neighbor? Jesus didn't answer the question. Jesus told a story about someone being a neighbor. Jesus just uncovered black mold. Look how the man responds. The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. Jesus told him, go and do thou likewise. Now, for many of us, we've heard this story hundreds of times. Being familiar might make it difficult to apply it correctly. Ever notice that we have a tendency to walk past the things that are most familiar to us? There are two errors we can fall into with this story. The lawyer falls into both of them. One is that we can over-moralize the story. The other is that we can over-spiritualize the story. The way you diagnose which way you lean is to ask the question, who do I identify with in the story? If you see yourself only as the Samaritan, you're in danger of over-moralizing the story. The story began with a question, what do I need to do to inherit eternal life? That's the wrong question. We are not saved by doing good things. We are saved by a good thing Jesus has done. 
If you hear this story and you believe I have to do better by being good, you are over moralizing the story. Another person in the story, folks, we're the man in the ditch, helpless, unable to do anything for ourselves. We need someone to rescue us. The Apostle Paul said, you see, at just the right time when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. I think Jesus' parables were told so that after the cross and after the empty tomb, we would recognize that Jesus is the one who rescues us. He's the one who ran. He's the one who hired the workers at the end. He's the one who answered the consistent knocking on the door in the middle of the night. Another error we can fall into is to over-spiritualize the story. Do I only identify with the man in the ditch? You know you're over-spiritualizing when you ask for definitions of simple words. Who is my neighbor? Jesus has done this all for me, so I don't have to do anything for anyone else. But I would have to ignore what Jesus says at the end of the story if that's the way I think. Jesus said, go and do likewise. Compassion is doing something for somebody on the side of the road. Here's something I noticed in the story. The Samaritan had a prepared heart. Seeing the guy in the ditch wasn't something. So when, when Cheryl and I are out and we see someone with a sign, begging many times, my first thought is not, what do I have to do to give to this person? But rather, many times when I see somebody, I feel relief because I can walk by or I can drive by. We can justify what is that? That's called black mold. And I would venture to say that I'm probably not the only one. <clears throat> Jesus records these words. Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. And if one of you says to, to them, go in peace, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is that? James said that. The Samaritans, he not only had a prepared heart, but also proximity. He was there. This story is about a prepared heart that responds to those in close proximity to us. So, two prayers this week. First, dear God, would you reveal any black mold in my heart so we can get rid of it? The second prayer, dear God, would you put me in proximity to someone in need whenever it is safe to be around others? See if Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 to 10 doesn't offer a commentary on this story of the Good Samaritan. Paul said this, Once you were dead because of your disobedience and your many sins. You used to live in sin, just like the rest of the world, obeying the devil, the commander of the powers of the unseen world. He is the spirit at work in the hearts of those who refuse to obey God. All of us used to live that way, following the passionate desires and inclinations of our sinful nature. By our very nature, we were subject to God's anger, just like everyone else. But God is so rich in mercy, and he loved us so much that even though we were dead because of our sins, he gave us life when he raised Christ from the dead. It's only by God's grace that you've been saved. If he raised us from the dead along with Christ, and seated us with him in the heavenly realms because we are united with Christ Jesus. So God can point to us in all future ages as examples of the incredible wealth of his grace and kindness toward us as shown in all he has done for us who are united with Christ Jesus. God saved you by his grace when you believed. You can't take credit for this. It is a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we have done, so none of us can boast about it. For we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus. So we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. Would you pray with me? Father, we ask that you would reveal to us the black mold in our lives. Those things which 
we need to get rid of those things which are ugly. That we might be more like Jesus in the way that we talk and act and live. We ask that you'd guide us. That you would help us to be someone full of compassion. So that we might be Jesus to other people. These things we ask in his name. Amen. Have a great week. We'll see you next week.